from MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. A developing story all morning long, a house fire in Butte off of Colorado Street. MTN's John Amy will join us in this half hour to chat about what he's learned thus far. All right, 6.30. This is a kind of our shot on the iCam um, over in Butte right now. It's something we've been following since we started this morning at 5 o'clock. Uh, Jay McDonald, Chet Lehman with you. A house fire in Butte right off of Colorado Street. Uh, MTN's John Amy has been there all morning long talking with neighbors. Just recently talked with the son of the homeowners, and it sounded like everybody got out safe, but they are looking for one family pet a dog. Right. We'll continue to check in with John on that. Uh, here's uh, what the uh, firefighters are uh, dealing mm -hmm. with as they battle that uh, blaze all morning long. Uh, single digits. Uh, at one point uh, this morning, the wind chill was actually below zero, so that is a certain challenge uh, for the firefighters there. We're keeping good thoughts for them on the St. Patrick's Day. Not how they wanted to spend their St. No. Patrick's Day morning. No. Certainly not that family either. Nine below right now in West Yellowstone. Fifteen above in Bozeman at the airport. Thirteen. Uh, we'll have more weather. I'll uh, have your forecast uh, for the St. Patrick's Day parade as well. Uh, all that uh, and this uh, final weekend of uh, winter all coming up in uh, just a couple minutes. All right, looking forward to it, Chet. Now we're going to see if John Amy is ready for us live over in Butte again. He's been covering this fire all morning long, talking with neighbors, um, just being on the ground there, being a presence and seeing what's going on. So, John, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? Um, tell us a little bit about the scene. Well, Jane, I, I'm actually here with the homeowner. This is Dave. He was in the house at the time. Dave, again, such an absolute tragedy. We're sorry to hear this, but can you tell me how, what happened? How did you find out about this? When did this happen while you were there? Well, I heard this beeping noise and uh, I got up and I uh, thought it might have been something in the kitchen. And I went into the kitchen and there was nothing there, a little bit of smoke. Um, I turned around and I could see the smoke was getting thicker towards the front of the house and I started and then it got so thick and black and I got to the between the well right before the living room and it was right. this huge wall of flame oh my god and yeah it was and I could just feel the heat and the, the smoke and I just started yelling fire get the, right. my wife out of bed and my grandson out of bed and we came out the south side here and you got out how old's your grandson He's going to be 11 tomorrow. Wow. And you were able to wake them up. This was what, at 3 in the morning? 3.20 this morning. 3.20 this morning. You were able to wake your, your wife and your grandson. You got out. Yeah. And just uh, how's everybody doing well, right now? I well, we're all, all stunned. We're shocked. I mean, we got across the street. It called 911 uh, immediately from uh, Station 1, I think it is. And, uh, and then uh, the uh, two police officers showed up, right. and then a truck from the boulevard showed up. And uh, and then the, one of the sergeants on the scene, the police sergeant, took right. our information and said that we could go. We called my son, David. He came Dave down. Was here. I just talked. Yeah, to him. yeah, yeah. He came down and picked us up, and so we went up to his place. At so his you've got apartment. a place to stay. Right. Right, right now, it's temporary. Wow. Yeah. I just can't imagine. This has got to be devastating for you guys on this day, and I'm really yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad everybody was able to get out. Right. Well, that, that's, that was our primary concern. The rest of it's just stuff. I can't replace my, my relatives. That, that is a very good point. So, again, very sad. We don't know the cause just yet, obviously. Oh. But 3 o'clock in the morning, this is a devastating way to wake up. But fortunately, you were up. And the, the important part is he was able to get his family out. We can replace the stuff. You cannot replace family. We're just monitoring this scene right now and uh, and uh, back to you in the studio. All right, MTN's John Amy, thank you very much. And couldn't have said it better. Thankfully, everybody got out safe, still looking for one dog, but human life. I mean, that's just something you, you cannot replace. MTN's John Amy was going to talk about a little bit about St. Patrick's Day with us. Of course, he had to pivot to some breaking news over off of Colorado Street. But yesterday, John Amy did get the chance to talk with one of the classics and I would argue one of the most iconic bands to grace the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Butte. The kids here at the Head Start program got their St. Patrick's Day spirit going a little early with a visit today from the Edmonton Pipe and Drum Band. The band is happy to be back in Butte after missing the past two St. Patrick's Day celebrations due to the pandemic. It's uh, marvelous. We've missed uh, all the friends we've made here. Uh, we've uh, seen these 
friends and families and, uh, and fans for years, decades. The Pipes and Drums Band of the Edmonton Police Service have been regular guests for Butte St. Patrick's Day since 1984. They've returned this year and are playing at different venues around the city and enjoy coming back each year. It's the, the warm welcome that uh, the people in Montana give us when we come. They're, uh, we love to see the smiling faces and uh, people celebrating and shaking hands. The kids at the Head Start School in Butte got an early concert on March 16th. <laughs> they loved it. I was watching their little faces and the smiles and the clapping and the, the wiggling and the dancing. They absolutely loved it. Josie, what did you think of this show? It was awesome. It was awesome, wasn't it? Yeah. What was your favorite part? When they, when they did the, the drumming, the drumming was awesome. Yeah, did, did it get you in the mood for St. Patrick's Day? Yeah. The the celebration, the uh, people coming out, the warm welcome, the handshakes, the friendly uh, conversations, and uh, just the appreciation for the music that we uh, we provide. That uh, makes our efforts all worth it. The travel time, the uh, time pra practicing. All right, thank you very much, John Amy. Now focusing more on the capital um, of our state. After a lengthy debate, the Montana Senate gave initial approval to a bill that would put a definition into state law for the word sex when referring to a human. MTN senior political reporter Jonathan Amberian was on the Senate floor and he tells us what's at issue. Senate Bill 458 passed 28 to 22 Wednesday in a preliminary vote on the Senate floor. Supporters said it made a relatively simple change, while opponents said the effects could be broader than expected. SB 458, sponsored by Republican Senator Carl Glimm of Kyla, would define a person's sex throughout Montana law as being based on their reproductive system, male or female. Glimm said the bill was about creating a definition for sex separate from gender, and he pointed to a court decision that blocked a law the legislature passed last session that would have prevented transgender people from changing the sex on their birth certificate without a court order showing they had undergone surgical transition. We can have policy discussions about where we want to use these terms terms later, but we need to define what those terms mean because right now we're getting into lawsuits because these terms get conflated and we don't have clear definitions. Opponents said the bill's definitions were too simplistic to account for all people, and they questioned the fiscal impact, saying it could lead to litigation and potential financial consequences from the federal government for going against their policy on discrimination based on sex. On a bill of this size and of this importance, to what degree is it responsible for our body to sign off on that bill? The mayor may not create substantial future costs to our general fund. The Senate added an amendment Wednesday that seeks to address concerns about how the bill would affect intersex people, but opponents questioned if that was enough. The bill will now have to pass a final vote in the Senate before moving over to the House. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Thank you very much, Jonathan. 637 now, a new pilot program is looking at if training service dogs could be a form of therapy for veterans with PTSD. Elizabeth Ruiz shows us the results they're seeing so far. Say that you're a veteran who's been diagnosed with PTSD. Lap. Yes. These dogs have been trained to help you stay grounded. Unconditional love. <laughs> She's like, I can touch it, I promise. It's the way Andres Ortiz Rodriguez explains his bond with Linda. He's training Linda to be a service dog for another fellow veteran. My stepdad was in the army. He was a tanker at Fort Knox. So I kind of just wanted to follow in his footsteps. My brother joined uh, the Air Force. He deployed to Kuwait. Andres was deployed to Iraq in 2011. A couple years ago, he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Good girl. He says the mental health doctor is the one who told him about Paws for Purple Hearts. Linda, off. Paws for Purple Hearts is a nonprofit. Yes. We provide a really unique program called Canine Assisted Warrior Therapy, where we partner with VA and DOD facilities locally in the area, and groups of veterans or active duty service members actually help partake in the training of our service dogs for another fellow service member. Whoa. 
Senior Program Instructor Erica Horn says she was thrilled when asked to participate in a five-year pilot program through the PAWS Act. PAWS stands for Puppies Assisting Wounded Service Members. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs says its goal is to explore the benefits of service dog training for veterans with PTSD. The pilot program is being offered in Alaska, California, Florida, North Carolina, and Texas. Hey, baby, good girl. Get it! The dog can help just by its presence, but also they can be specifically task trained to help bring an individual, maybe ground them in the moment if they're having a panic attack or, you know, they get startled by a loud noise or something like that. The dog can provide deep pressure therapy by, you know, leaning against them or nudging them to bring them back to reality. They're only six months into the pilot program, but Erica says she's already seen a huge difference in the lives of veterans. Can I Week by week, I will see individuals open up a lot more and just really make that connection with the dog. When we sat down to talk with Andres, we saw the impact Linda had on him. You learn to kind of just suppress your feelings, just show anger, just because realistically, you don't have time to show emotion over there. Um, if something hits the fan, you're, you kind of just have to react. It, it just kind of like... Like I said, it's just hard for me to show feelings. So like, you know, just being able to see her here and like just, so it's a different, you know. I know, baby, I know. A psychologist with the South Texas VA says this pilot program has been giving service members like Andres a greater purpose in life and getting them out into the community. If the pilot program proves to be successful through data over the next five years, the VA says it will be offered as another therapy option for veterans across the country. Elizabeth Ruiz, Scripps News, San Antonio. Pretty neat stuff. 641, that pause for Purple Heart says it takes about two to three years to train service dogs. The dogs will learn more than 100 commands before they're placed with a service member. Really neat stuff. Okay, we're going to take a quick break here, but John Amy will be with us shortly. Chat more about that breaking news of that Butte fire off of Colorado Street. Stay with us.